Yay! Yay! Okay, this is our last uh, of our apparent trilogy in integrating rings. Um, let's see, the first thing we did was we integrated around a ring to find what the field was due to a ring of charge um, some distance away along the axis. Um, then what we did is we said, oh, cool, now that we have that, now I can integrate a whole bunch of rings um, to form a disk. So we did that. Uh, and once we had the disk, then we could do an infinite sheet um, and, and, and so on. So here's the last one. Um, this one uh, is a more involved example, and I'm not saying it's easy. Um, what I am saying is that it's useful to do it, or at least to see it done, so you can appreciate that there is a way faster and easier way to do it that we'll talk about um, coming up. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to um, integrate rings of different sizes to make a sphere. And so uh, it looks like uh, this. All right, so here we go. Um, the red thing is our ring. Um, and what we're going to do uh, is integrate from theta equals zero. Uh, theta is going to go from zero to two. Oops, not two pi. The deal is if I take theta from zero to pi, we're going to sweep out all those rings of different sizes, like here's one, and here's one, and here's one, right? We're just looking at the cross section of these things. Here's one, here's one, here's one, all the way to the back of the sphere. Um, and we're going to be out here. We're going to be out at this R point. And what we want to know is for a sphere that's charged up to plus Q, what does the field look like uh, at some point um, out there? And we'll also do inside the sphere too. So for any any little r. So what we're going to do, if you imagine uh, from that vantage point, if you're looking at the sphere, I can imagine little rings. And if the rings sweep all the way back, I've sort of described um, the sphere. All right. So that's what we're going to do. So theta is going to go from zero to pi, because then I'll have swept out the entire sphere. Uh, let me let me erase these little lines. Bloop. Okay, a little bit cleaner diagram. Uh, okay, so theta goes from zero to two pi. Um, what do we know? What is the field from one ring? Um, I can write that down. The field from one ring we said was k q z, where z is the distance from the ring to the point I'm interested in, right? And this was uh, R, you know what? I've already got R on the diagram. Um, so I'm just going to call this R prime. I don't know, some other. Anyway, the radius of the ring. Uh, R prime squared plus Z squared to the three halves. There we go. So this was our electric field from a ring of radius R prime um, out to some distance Z. Okay. so. Obviously, maybe what we're going to do is call that DQ because all these rings are going to be teeny tiny thin and they're going to carry each a little bit of charge. And when I add them up, then I'm going to get the whole charge of the sphere. Um, all right. So what else am I going to need to know? First of all, uh, I'm going to want to know um, what is the radius of each of these rings? Um, so that is, I've sort of indicated that here. What's the size of each ring? Well, it's going to change depending on theta, right? Like when theta is close to zero, the rings are really tiny on the sort of the, the, the right-hand pole of the sphere. And so the height or the radius of each of those rings is this red line. And isn't that just R sine theta, right? I would like all this stuff to be in terms of one variable, just theta. So if I sweep theta from zero to pi, I can talk about... Um, uh, the size of each ring, the radius, is just going to be r sine theta. Uh, so that's the thing. r sine theta is going to be that. It's going to be my. It's going to be my r. And then what I'm going to need to know is z, because as I sweep back through the sphere, the distance from each of those rings to the point I'm interested in is changing, right? Um, but it's changing in a neat way that I can uh, write in terms of theta. Uh, okay, so 
when theta, look at when theta is pi over two, when theta is 90 degrees, um, then the distance really is just r, right? Um, when theta is between zero and pi over two, it's this green line, right? That's how far sort of in front of the middle of the sphere the, the ring is. And I can describe that, that's easy. That's just r cosine theta, right? That's the, that's the length of that uh, green line. So the distance between the ring and the point I'm interested in, I can write that as z is just gonna become, what is that distance? It's just the total distance minus that bit, r cosine theta, right? That should take care of that. Um, all right, so it looks like I'm gonna have something like this. I'm gonna have something like my electric field is gonna be the integral. Uh, and just for kicks, I'm gonna put the, the limits in here, uh, zero to pi. Um, and I'm gonna have my uh, k dq times z. Okay, here we go. Z was r minus big R cosine theta. And then on the bottom, I have r prime squared. Okay, so that's going to be, uh, what did we say that was? That was um, r sine theta, right? So that's gonna be r squared sine squared theta plus, uh-oh, r minus r cosine theta, all of that squared and all of that to the three halves. Oh, what a mess. Um, not only that, um, but we have to fix this up a little bit because uh, my integral is zero to pi. I want to d theta, right? I want to integrate around theta. But what I've got in there is a q. So I'm going to need to change from, uh, use our little tricks, I'm going to need to change from dq to d theta. I got to do that. So I got to change variables. Okay, so the trick was, what we said was, we're going to take a little bit of charge compared to the whole charge. And now um, we're talking about, uh, uh, this is over the surface of the sphere, right? So this is like surface area. So a little bit of charge compared to the whole charge is like a little bit of surface area. So the surface area, the surface of a ring divided by the surface for the sphere. How about I say that? Okay, uh, let's write down what that is. So, well, the bottom, that's easy. What's the surface area of a sphere for pi big R squared? There we go. Uh, that's not so bad. The surface area of the ring. Now, let's see, how are we gonna get that? Um, what we should do is it's gonna be the circumference of the ring multiplied by its thickness, right? That's gonna get us a little bit of surface area. Circumference times the thickness. Um, okay, so what is the circumference of the ring? The circumference of the ring is two pi times its radius, but we already said that the radius is r sine theta. So I got this. So I got two pi r sine theta. Okay, that's the circumference of each ring times the thickness of each ring. Okay, so I've kind of drawn that, uh, that's a really thick ring uh, that I have up there indicated by d theta. Um, uh, in fact, I've got my, oh, I got my little laser pointer, right? So up here, there's my d theta. That's the thickness of the ring. Um, now, d theta is the amount of angle, is how thick the ring is. But I want the actual thickness of the ring, not just the angular thickness, because it depends on the r, right? The, the bigger the radius, then the thicker that thing is going to be for a, for a d theta. So the thickness of the ring is actually going to be r d theta. Right, I actually want that arc length. And the arc length is just r times the angle, r times d theta. Okay, so I have, let's see, I have two pi uh, r times thickness. Okay, that should be it, right? Um, so let's see, I got r, r, r squared. Those are gonna go away, that's cool. The pi's are gonna go away. That's um, actually gonna, this is, might actually be kinda easy. Um, this is going to be a one half sine theta d theta. Look at that. 
So it looks like I can write my dq in terms of my d theta like this. Um, dq is just going to be q over 2 times sine theta d theta. Okay, so uh, let's see what we've got. So I have 0 to pi. Um, k dq. Okay, so I'm going to have my k. I'm going to move it out to the, I'm going to move it out front because I know these things are just constants, right? So I got my k q over 2. Um, now what else? Uh, my dq, I'm going to have my uh, r minus r cosine theta. And then this is going to be times sine theta d theta. And now I have that awful denominator. I have r squared sine squared theta plus r minus r cosine theta squared to the three halves. Okay, so here's what I got. Um, I think I think we're kind of ready to go. I think that's the I think that's the interval. I think that's I think that's it. Um, so we're ready to re ready to go. Um, gosh, that looks that looks terrible. Um, definitely not looking like it's an elementary form. Um, right. Part of the problem is that it's in terms of the variable theta, and I got thetas all over the place. I got a sine up top, and then I got a sine squared and a cosine squared. Um, look. If you look down in the denominator, that kind of gives me a hint. Sine squared, cosine squared. That makes me think that maybe if I just went ahead and multiplied that thing out, um, I've got an r squared sine squared, r squared cosine squared when I multiply it out. So I can sort of combine those terms. So if I just if I'm just brave and I multiply that thing out, maybe it'll get a little bit easier. I don't know. Let's see. So I'm gonna. Uh, this is gonna be. Uh, separate these things. Okay. So this is going to be k q over 2 0 to pi. Uh, on top I got my same thing that I had before. Um, and in the denominator, let's see. I got r squared sine squared theta and then I'm going to have a plus r squared plus, whoops, that'll be minus 2r r cosine theta uh, plus uh, r squared. Oh, I got to squeeze it in. Cosine squared theta to the three halves. Did I make it? Just made it. Um, all right. Oh, great. So now I think I can just barely squeeze this in two. So now I got this k q over two. Zero to pi. Uh, same. I'm tired of writing this numerator already. Cosine sine theta d theta. And then on the bottom, I can squeeze it right above my head. Um, I got. Okay. Look r squared sine squared theta, r squared cosine squared theta, those, that's just r squared, right? Sine squared plus cosine squared is one. That's cool. So uh, I wind up having um, big r squared plus little r squared minus two big r little r cosine theta, the three halves. Okay. Well, all I've done is just simplify it a little bit, but um, maybe, maybe, maybe I can find uh, that this is in a standard form. Um, and the reason that I think maybe we can do it is um, we got cosine theta. Uh, like the first thing I might try is a u substitution, right? So maybe if u is cosine theta, du is going to be sine theta uh, minus i guess minus sine theta i can never remember um so anyway i got that uh so i have a cosine up top cosine on the bottom those are my u's and then my sine theta that's my du so that that might be that might be fruitful um i think i think we should try that let's try that okay so next page
Ah, uh, shoot. Now i got to write the integral again. Um, well, I will just do it. So here we go. Zero to pi. Uh, let's see. I had it written down over here somewhere. So uh, oh, k, q, I can't forget that. k, whoops, it's not theta. It's crazy. k, q over 2. Uh, let's see. Okay, so I had my... Uh, R minus R cos and theta uh, up top. And then I had my R squared plus big R squared minus 2 R R cos and theta. Maybe I switched, switched those terms around three halves. Uh, and then I got my sine theta d theta. Okay. Um, so, oops sort of written it where you can't see it and it'll be probably important to actually see it How about that cool all right um so the first thing we should do is try this let's try uh u is uh cos and theta and then du is minus sine theta d theta let's try that because then I'll have this kq over 2 0 to pi. I, I sort of mentioned when we've done this before, um, I just go ahead and the mathematicians are going to be mad at me, but I just keep the limits of the integral the same because I'm going to back substitute before I put the limits in. So I don't bother going through the business of trying to recalculate my limits. I don't care. So I'll just keep them like that. Uh, it's sort of a reminder that later I want to go back to theta before I plug the limits in. Um, okay, so let's see, r minus, that's going to be r minus uh, r u. Okay, so my du is sine theta d theta. I'm going to have a minus sign. So what I can do is I can flip the thing around that's on top, right? A minus, the thing that's on top just flips it. So that's going to be a r u minus r. And then in the denominator, I'm going to have r squared plus big R squared minus 2R R U to the 3 halves du. Okay, I think, I think that's right. Um, now, this is a little bit simpler looking integral uh, than we had before. It's actually two integrals um right because the 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 numerator is ha, has two parts so i can uh th there's an integral that's r u over the stuff in the denominator and there's an integral that's little r over the stuff in the denominator those are two different forms um and now this isn't an elementary integral um i i don't i i, I can't solve this using elementary means so it turns out I can give up and I can go look it up, right? Uh, because this isn't necessarily, I don't want to spend all my time going back and doing integrals by, you know, partial fractions or trig substitutions or whatever is necessary. Let's just look it up. Um, okay, so the form that we have here, the, the little, look at the denominator, the little r plus big r down here, this thing, uh, I'm just going to call that, uh, what did I call it, c? Um, this part, it's almost like a quadratic formula. This part I'm going to call B. Those are just constants. Uh, so this is equal to uh, KQ over 2. And then here is, here is the integral. As I looked it up, here's the way it's written. R, it's 2BU plus or C kind of reminds you of the quadratic, doesn't it? Uh, over this business on the bottom, it's going to be B squared uh, times the square root of uh, C minus B U. And then the other piece is plus 2 B R uh, over the same thing. B squared numbers of square root of C minus B U. And uh, this, 
it's supposed to be evaluated from zero to pi, right? But like I say, I'm not going to put those in until I sort of back substitute. Okay, so let's put in what this stuff actually is. This is going to be a q over two. Uh, this is over the same denominator. So, um, what is it? The denominator b squared. That's going to be It'll be a large numerator and then the denominator it's going to be b squared times the square root of that junk so what was b b was minus 2 r u so this is going to be 4 r squared big r squared uh let's see what we got on top um r times 2 b u okay so 2 b u so this is going to be a minus 4 or big R, there's a big R out front squared, right? That's the first term, that times U. Um, plus 4C, let's see, that's going to be easy. That's plus 4R, oops. 4R squared plus 4 big R squared um, plus 2BR plus... Uh, minus four uh, r squared big r okay like that um now what do we notice oops i forgot my in here that for, uh forgot my big r right there okay uh what we notice is that this term and that term go away which is really nice there's also an r squared everywhere, so I can just do bloop, bloop, um, bloop. Oh, and this one is an r. That was supposed to be r cubed, right? So I got one big r left up there. Okay. Uh, let's see. For and this one is. Yeah, that one was squared. Okay, so what's left? This is awful, but I'm getting to the point. A Q over two. <clears throat> Hopefully you've like fast forwarded through this part. Um, what I've got on the bottom, there's a four everywhere. So this is just gonna be a one over R squared. Uh, and then what's left is R minus R U up top. So this is getting a lot simpler. And then on the bottom, I have this square root. And let me write out what that is. Uh, r squared plus r squared minus 2 uh, big R little r times u. And again, this is from, it will be from 0 pi. So uh, plug in what our u was. Now we're ready. We're ready to just sort of do this. So k u over 2 over r squared. Uh, R minus R cos and theta. Minus two R. Zero to pi. Okay. Now, cool stuff happens when you plug in zero and pi. Notice that that's places where cosine just becomes a one and a minus one, right? So things are going to get um quite a bit easier once we plug this in okay so take that one over r squared take that outside and look what we have this is really cool k q or two r squared look what we're going to have if i plug in um if i plug in pi let's do the pi first if i plug in pi cosine of pi is minus one Right, so this is going to become r plus r, and on the bottom, let's do the let's take these terms one by one. On the bottom, I'm going to have r squared plus little r squared minus a uh, plus two r r. Okay, so it's going to be the square. Oh, and look what that was. That's going to be a perfect square, right? That's going to be the square root of big R plus little r squared. So when I take the square root, I'm going to get the positive, or one way to write that is r plus r, like that. Right? That's going to be the square root of the squared quantity. 
uh, and that's it. So let's take the zero. Let's plug in zero. So cosine is just one. So now I'm going to have a minus r minus, take our minus little r, and then on the bottom, cosine of theta, if it's zero, is just one. So that's going to be r, uh, that's going to be big R minus little r quantity squared, square root. So it's just going to be this. The positive value of that. Now that's really interesting. Um, so let's take two cases. If we're outside the sphere, then we're at a point where little r is greater than big R, right? Um, just checking, checking the run diagram. Here's little r and big R. If little r is bigger than big R, we're outside the sphere, right? So, okay, so. If that's true, um, the thing on the left is just going to be a one, right? It's just the positive quantity. They're both positive. Positive quantity over the positive quantity. So that's a one minus uh, little r is bigger than big R, right? So this thing is negative. But the bottom is going to be positive, so, so it's overall negative. So you get a factor of two which cancels the two in the front, and look what you get. This is going to be uh, the electric field is KQ over R squared. Look at that result. That's really cool. So if you're outside the sphere, the result is that the electric field is exactly the same thing as if it were just a point charge in the middle of the sphere. It's like you've collapsed the sphere all the way down to a little point. Um, that is really, really cool. That's a cool result. So it doesn't matter where you are on the outside, just as long as you're outside the sphere. We'll see this. We'll, we'll get this a much, much faster way in a couple, uh, a couple more units. Um, that is a really, really cool result. Uh, so you don't even have to worry about the sphere. Just treat the sphere like a point charge um, where you're some distance away from the center. Very, very cool. Now, what if you're inside? Here it gets neat too. If r, little r is less than big R, if you're inside, now let's see what happens. Uh, so again, the first term, uh, that's going to turn into what? Big R minus little r in the same quantity. But that's positive. That's just going to be a 1. Um, and then if little r is less than big R, the second quantity over here, that's just going to be a 1 also, right? Because big R minus little r, if little r is less, is going to be a positive quantity. So it's one minus one or zero. That is neat. So the electric field inside of a spherical conducting shell, anywhere inside. Now you might imagine it's easy maybe to think about the electric field being zero at the origin because all the arrows are going all different ways and so they all cancel out. That, that might be kind of easy to, to think of. But it's less obvious maybe that if you are anywhere inside, uh, the electric field is zero. That's pretty cool. Even if you're really, really close to the wall, um, but still inside, the electric field is gonna be zero. That's cool. Um, and you might think this only applies along R, but understand that we can tilt the sphere any way we want to make R any direction we want. So by symmetry, this is true in any direction, All right? So anywhere you are inside the sphere, um, the electric field is going to be zero. We are definitely going to use that again. That's a that's a really neat uh, that's a really neat result. Okay, so this is a way too long way to get the result. We had to actually integrate over the surface of the sphere, and the integral was not easy. Um, the The main reason for doing this is so that uh, when we end up doing it a much much easier way um, here in a little bit, um, you'll appreciate the much easier way for for being uh, almost like a little miracle.